Hi, I'm Coach Kell. Welcome to today's mental fitness video, part of our ongoing series in which we take a look at everyday mental challenges and discuss tools from psychology and neuroscience that can help. Today, we have a message from a viewer that claims he's a bit slow. That is to say, he believes he's a slow learner. That can be a problem area for a lot of different reasons, not only for the direct effect of needing more time to pick up a skill, but also plenty of indirect effects, such as professional pressures, social pressures, and in the really unfortunate cases, missed opportunities and feelings of shame about it. That cocktail of effects can really harm our day-to-day -day health and make life feel pretty terrible. So let's see if we can help him out. So he writes, Dear Coach Kell, I'll say it up front, I'm a slow learner. It's not something I openly tell many people, but it does feel like I'm just a bit slow. Anytime that I've been studying a new subject in school or working in a group on a new project that has some kind of new element or system or process, I can always feel myself lagging behind everyone else. It doesn't feel like I retain information as quickly or come up with quick logical connections or insights about things. It's pretty stressful and I feel like I'm always having to put twice as much time into studying things as everyone else just to be at the same level. I've tried focusing on the different learning styles like visual and auditory and kinesthetic, and I think I'm auditory, but it doesn't feel like it has made a ton of difference. Is there anything that I can do to learn more quickly? Well, viewer, I can relate. Left to my own typical habits and behaviors, I'm honestly not the fastest learner either. And I know that uncomfortable feeling of the difference between how fast I'm picking things up compared to the people around me. The good news is, yes, there are a couple of big, simple things that will accelerate learning. To get into that, let's first break learning down using a little bit of neuroscience. Now, learning scientifically is an establishment or rearrangement or strengthening of neural connections in our brains and bodies. And to simplify things a bit, when we learn something new, a new electrical connection between neurons is formed for the first time. Now, that connection is weak at the start, but every time we reactivate the connection, it strengthens. Now, this is the scientific reason that practice makes us better at the physical and mental and even emotional lessons and skills we're trying to learn. The more we utilize the established neural pathways involved in a skill or new knowledge or develop additional connections as we refine them, the stronger those skills and knowledge get. The retention or enhancement of any knowledge or performance of any skill involves different areas of the brain and body. And our entire nervous system falls under this principle of strengthening neural connections, not just our brain. What I mean to say is that in terms of our nervous systems, the process of forming and strengthening these new neural connections is essentially the same no matter what the nature of the knowledge or skill is. Learning to lift heavier and heavier weights engages the same neurobiological processes in our brain as learning to do harder and harder math problems. And as you would expect, the reverse is also true. The less you use a skill or recall some piece of knowledge, the more those respective connections weaken over time, which is why we get rusty. Now, this process of learning by neuronal rearrangement is called neuroplasticity. And while it is, of course, biologically complex, we can simplify the process into two main parts. One, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, and two, good old-fashioned sleep. Now, let's cover some important details about both. Now, our bodies continually produce acetylcholine, so it's always sort of flowing and propagating itself to our cells. It's involved in tons of different everyday processes, including activation of muscle fibers. Our bodies use it every time we physically move. But in terms of the central nervous system, it has a variety of important roles in the enhancement of alertness when we wake up, sustaining attention, and you guessed it, learning and memory. So here's what's happening in our brains while we're learning. We're obviously encountering some new information or even physically moving in a new way or whatever the case may be. Now, while we're encountering these novel things or practicing them, the new neural connections are firing. But when they do, acetylcholine becomes attached to them. This process sort of flags these neurons. Like if our brains were a textbook, acetylcholine is the highlighter that's marking important things for later. An interesting note here for later, when we encounter frustration when we're trying to learn something, our brains actually begin to release more acetylcholine. More on that towards the end of the video. For now, just remember this part of the example, that we have engaged in learning something new and that the neural pathways involved in that learning are now highlighted with acetylcholine. Now fast forward to the end of the day and it's time for bed. We lay down, we go to sleep, and while we sleep, something fascinating happens. 
the neurons that were highlighted with acetylcholine will begin to repeatedly play back the firing patterns that took place earlier in the day, strengthening the connections. We literally rest and learn at the same time while we sleep. So that being said, what do you think happens when we don't get good sleep? Well, our brains never get the chance to go back over the highlighted information. And that's a shame because in terms of conscious effort, this is free review. In fact, it incentivizes quality rest. Overnight cramming might get you through a school exam, but it's one of the most biologically expensive and ineffective ways to learn anything at all. So to maximize learning, we need a healthy amount of high quality sleep, and we need to keep our acetylcholine levels up when the learning happens. Now, there are a million ways, right and wrong, to try to improve sleep quality. I'll cover some good ones in a future video, but for now, let's cover some tools to keep our acetylcholine high during those learning sessions when we're awake. First, let's talk about a behavioral tool. Remember I mentioned earlier that frustration during learning actually increases acetylcholine levels in our brain? Well, here's how to leverage that. When you're practicing the use of a new concept or skill, Try to structure the practice session so that the duration and difficulty are enough to trigger some frustration at some point. Then, when you hit that point of frustration, keep going for another 10 to 30 minutes and stay in the frustration. That should strike a good balance between maximizing our natural acetylcholine release and spending some of our daily emotional fuel. I recommend taking a good restful break between sessions as well. Ultimately, the important thing to remember is that behaviorally, frustration is a good thing to seek out when you're trying to learn something. Nutritionally, we can also increase acetylcholine by consuming foods ahead of time that are rich in its metabolic precursor, choline. And the richest sources of choline are meat, fish, poultry, dairy, and eggs. Fear not veggie friends, shiitake mushrooms, potatoes, legumes, Sunflower seeds and cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage are good sources too. There's also an over-the-counter supplement, alpha-GPC, which is another cholinic precursor that can support acetylcholine levels. Now, real quick, I want to shift gears here slightly and stick with me here because it's important. It's worth mentioning that the learning process works the same way with the neural connections that form our emotions. And this is why trauma can be so difficult to work through. When something hurts us or scares us, our brains install a protective mechanism that subconsciously pushes us away from similar experiences, even if a similar positive version of that experience would logically be beneficial for us. Now I'm talking about trauma, and trauma doesn't have to take the form of a big singular event either. It can also happen from long-term repeat exposures to the same minor bad experience in which those same neurons, the ones that fire during that mildly bad experience, are fired repeatedly over time. Neuroplasticity is actually engaging there. So we are literally learning pain. And that often creates some really difficult personal situations as those pathways quietly and insidiously strengthen over time. Going further, since it's being regularly repeated, the neural pathways involved can become even stronger than those in significant single event traumas. Eventually, the old, well-established neural connections of our previous fears and pains trigger our anxious or avoidant behaviors, and then those neural connections are also strengthened. This can leave us in a vicious cycle, which is extremely difficult to break. Now, why am I getting into all of this? Well, in the case of feeling like we're a slow learner, there's a good chance that the act of learning has probably become this exact type of minor recurring bad experience. And that's installing a trigger of negative emotions anytime a situation arises when we're about to learn something new. And that's gonna make it even tougher to learn anything quickly. Now, breaking emotional patterns of bad experiences is something that a qualified psychotherapist should do on an individual basis. But I wanna make sure we understand that our previous emotional experiences of learning have a very powerful effect on how motivated we are to engage in more of it. So don't leave that part unaddressed. So to wrap it all up, we can increase our learning speed by one, raising our acetylcholine levels with adequate practice and nutrition, two, getting an adequate amount of high quality sleep, and three, making sure we have a good relationship with the practice of learning itself. And as neuroscience goes, Improving our relationship with any activity directly involves our level of dopamine during that activity. 
If you want to learn a cool way to do that, make sure you check out my video about persisting through tasks, where I talk about a cool way to naturally boost dopamine levels going into a task. I'll put a link for that at the end and in the video description. That's what I have for today. If you have a question about a mental challenge you're having, send me a brief email at autonomy with an E, coach Kel at outlook.com. And I'll see if I can help with a video about your topic. By the way, these tools to enhance learning are part of a much wider set of foundational mental fitness courses for individuals and companies that I teach. I develop these courses from various studies in high quality, peer reviewed academic journals. I'm a practitioner, I literally practice what I preach, and I was able to use them to reduce my ADHD medication regimen by 90% while increasing focus, mental endurance, and holistic quality of life. If these tools can help me increase my natural focus and mental fitness by that much, I'm very confident that they can help you and your team. If that sounds interesting to you, again, feel free to send me an email at autonomycoachkel at outlook.com. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next one.